Hi. Having made a series of skills videos covering instrument flying, tracking, holding, approaches, PVN and autopilots, I think it's now time to move on to some more scenario-based topics. The first of these is going to be about how to think through what to do when things aren't going to plan. Not going to plan might mean a full-blown emergency such as engine failure or cockpit fire, but it needn't be that dramatic. It could simply be that the weather at the destination has fallen below minima, or a passenger is feeling airsick, or even just needs the toilet. It's really anything that prevents the flight continuing to plan. It might yet result in continuing to destination, but involves taking a decision in the light of new facts and executing that decision in the light of the situation as it plays out. And above all, we need a way to take these decisions and act on them in a calm and orderly way. Anxiety and panic are your worst enemies when things start to go wrong because they interfere with logic and good sense. One aid memoir, which is in common use in emergency or non-normal situations, is PPP. PPP stands for three things to be considered in unusual situations. Plane. Is the aircraft flying safely? Fly the aircraft as your first priority. Path. Is the altitude and direction of the aircraft safe? People. Talk to passengers about what's happened, enlist the help of any other pilot on board, talk to ADC, perhaps ask for help, declare an emergency, or even pan, 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 Golf Charlie Delta maintaining 5,000 feet standby. The three Ps might often be a precursor to the more detailed T Doda analysis that we're going to talk about in this video. I've been unfortunate enough to have suffered a lot of abnormal situations in my flying career. Some have been weather related, such as serious icing encounters, others technical issues like failed electrics, but my real bad luck has been with engine failures. There was a time when I kept count. Now I literally can't remember how many I've had. They have been on jets and pistons, on singles and twins, on civilian and military, over land and sea. I have, however, been fortunate enough never to have landed off a runway. So, though I would never describe myself as an expert in losing engines, I certainly have way above average experience of doing so. I've learned how to remain calm and focused. I particularly remember one many years ago when I was in a single piston midway over the widest part of the English Channel, between the Isle of Wight and Guernsey, when the engine ran rough and then stopped. This was long before I was formally trained in the techniques I'm going to talk about on this video, but I do remember the first thing I did, which was to turn to my ashen-faced then girlfriend and say, we're at 10,000 feet, we're descending at 500 feet a minute, we have 20 minutes to sort something out. And that, though spontaneous, not taught, is exactly the starting point of the technique I'm going to discuss in this video, T. Dodar. The three introductory things to say about T. Dodar are that one, it's not an alternative to abnormal and emergency checklists, it's an adjunct. It's mostly about what you do after the checklist is complete, but it may also help you decide which checklist to use and when. Two, there are many, many other techniques. And the point of making a video about this one is not to say it's the best, it's simply to ensure that you have a technique that you can immediately put into action. When your house is on fire is not the time when you refuse to use an iPhone in favor of an Android. And three, this technique only works if you use it. Maybe an obvious thing to say, but I've been training on the sim and on the aircraft, thoroughly briefed T. Dodar, started a scenario and boom, everything is thrown out of the window in a panicked urgency to do something. It reminds me of the best line from the best sitcom. Something must be done. This is something, therefore we must do it. But doing the wrong thing is worse than doing nothing. So the biggest takeaway from this video is not the particular technique to be used in unexpected circumstances. It is a deeply ingrained ability to recognize that you are in an unexpected situation and then to make yourself use the technique methodically and fully without a sense of panic. I can't teach you not to panic, but I can suggest a way that you can teach yourself. Every time you're in a situation where you don't really need to engage your brain, on a dog walk, in the shower, on a train journey, just put yourself in your mind into a scenario. It needn't be losing an engine over the sea, but maybe smoke in the cockpit resulting in you having to turn the battery master off, 
or a call from your departure airfield to say a wheel has fallen from your aircraft on takeoff. You use your imagination. And then using the technique I'm about to talk about, just walk yourself through the next 30 minutes, decision by decision. If you'd like to try a simple example, imagine you're flying a Piper Arrow, a simple aircraft with retractable gear. After takeoff, you operate the gear switch, the three greens vanish, but the red light, gear in transit, stays on. Apply TDODAR. You can consider this scenario in several varieties, departing from a private strip, departing from a regional airport, departing from your maintenance base, etc. If you have that practice of thinking it through in a safe environment, then there's hope that when it happens for real, you can think it through calmly and logically because you've practiced. So that's the big takeaway from this video. Not the value of a particular technique, but having a technique at your fingertips and the presence of mind to apply the technique. The technique I'm going to describe is TDODAR. It's used widely in UK airlines. I'm not sure where else it's used, but it seems to work for us. TDODAR is not a linear process of steps, but a loop that runs continuously from when the situation arises to when it's finally resolved, which normally means landing an engine switched off. The elements in the loop are time, diagnosis, options, decision, act, review. The time element is the most recently added to the original DODAR sequence. It's a measure of how long we have to act. It's a combination of two important elements. The first is, do we have enough time to go through the rest of the steps? If you suffer an engine failure during the takeoff run, there isn't time for a long think. In the aircraft I'm talking about here, the usual range of Cessna 172 to Navajo, there's no option to continue the takeoff. So the only thing you can do is bring the aircraft to a stop in a straight line. The actions are instinctive memory items, executed immediately, there's no time for anything else. The second use of time is to determine how long you can afford for the rest of the process. Think of the example I gave a minute ago. I knew my altitude, I knew my rate of descent, so I knew exactly how long I had. Another example is if fuel is limited. You need to land with at least minimum fuel, so you need to know how much time you have to get the wheels on the ground, which might itself limit your options. One more comment or maybe adage about time in an emergency or unusual situation. This dates back to before we had electronic clocks and was the first thing to do in the event of an emergency is to wind the watch. This simply meant that you should stop the feeling of urgency or panic by doing something mundane that slows the brain down and gives us a chance to process. I remember that in my twin jet days, if we got an engine fire on rotation, a situation that many might think of the direst emergencies, there was only one immediate action, which was to acknowledge and thereby silence the warning bell. Everything else could and should wait. And one more comment about time. Don't let ATC rush you into a hasty decision. They're a great asset in an emergency you can offload work onto them, like getting weather or even suggesting suitable airfields, and you should keep them informed about your thinking. But the decision and the decision-making process is yours and yours alone. If you're in difficulties, it's up to them to keep traffic away from you and keep you aware of any terrain concerns. But their priorities, like planning traffic around you, should not weigh on your mind. It's their job. However, they'll be keen to help in any way they can. So use their well-meant help and advice, but don't be driven by it. Sometimes you just need to tell them to stand by while you process your thoughts. They're professional enough to understand. So, the T in TDODAR is time. The first D is diagnose. You need to know as much as possible about what your problem is. You may be able to do a full diagnosis and reach a definitive conclusion, like a particular circuit breaker has failed, or your diagnosis may be as broad and simple as the right engine has failed, without knowing or suspecting the cause. You just need to have as good a diagnosis as you can, moderated by the time factor. If you have 15 minutes to get on the ground, you can't afford 12 of them diagnosing, but you may allow yourself, say, two minutes. Another adage from the old days was taught to me by one of my early captains. John had learnt on Tiger Moths, had flown hurricanes in the Battle of Britain, DC-4s in the Berlin airlift, and then ended up as a training captain on TriStars. 
he was the calmest, funniest, and most proficient pilot I've ever met. He used to say, sit on the fin, old chap, sit on the fin, by which he meant, get your face out of the presenting problem and look down on the whole situation from high up and far back. This is rather more prosaically called situational awareness, but I like John's version. So when diagnosing, go back and sit on the fin, take a broad perspective, and above all, make sure you're still flying the aircraft. There's little point in a detailed diagnosis if you then pull the wings off in a spiral dive or fly into a mountain. Next in T-Dodar is O for options. You should outline to yourself, maybe write down, the options available to you. There are usually more options than you first thought of, and you want as many reasonable options to choose between as you can reasonably think of. I'll give an example. One good Friday, we were on a jet, climbing out of Seville, and had an engine failure near the top of climb, somewhere between Granada and Cordoba. We were an emergency air ambulance and the patient needed to get back to the UK. I forget why it had to be the UK, maybe a transplant organ had been found there. Normal operating procedures would be to land at the nearest suitable airport, which might have been Cordoba or Granada. But we widened the options to places that might sensibly be expected to have a fleet of ambulances readily available on the holiest day of the Spanish year, and therefore included Madrid and Lisbon as options. Much further away, so carrying some risk, but potentially keeping our patient alive. We opted for Madrid, used the flight time to talk to operations on HF radio, and by the time we were parked up, a replacement ambulance with a Spanish crew pulled up nearby, and the patient was at his destination only about two hours behind the original plan. When you're listing options, don't be critical as you go. There is time for sifting in a moment, but for the time being, just lay out the possible options. Also, think laterally. If all the world around you is reporting fog, then you might think of flying to another air mass hundreds of miles away. But equally, you might wonder if some VFR airfield might be popping up through the tops of the fog into the clear air that you're in. The second D is for decide. This is the point at which you think through each of the options and evaluate it. The evaluation will primarily be a safety decision and the safest options should be always at the forefront of your mind. But it's also wise to consider utility, cost and convenience, not just your own, but of others too. If you're low on fuel and your nearest airfield is a major international airport, but 10 miles further is a GA field, is it really in everyone's best interest for you to disrupt the airline traffic cost yourself thousands and end up somewhere without Avgas? In dire emergency, the answer is yes, but there's a lot to be said for the GA field. This was brought home to me by a friend who was the 767 fleet manager for a major national flag carrier. He told me that one of his captains had an engine failure somewhere east of Corfu. The airline SOPs said to land at the nearest suitable airfield. Athens and Tirana were suitable, but Tirana was a few minutes nearer, so he followed instructions and went to Tirana. That left the airline having to find accommodation and transport for 250 people in a city with, in those communist days, almost no facilities, no major handling agent, and probably, at the time, no consular access. The task was enormous and cost the airline a fortune. For 10 minutes extra flight time, they would have been at an airport, which is a regular destination for the airline, with all the facilities to handle the passengers and crew. The captain was probably making a point about the restrictive nature of the company SOPs, but he couldn't be criticized. The rules were changed to give the captain more prerogative soon after. So safety first, but also consider other ancillary factors that don't detract too much from safety. Sometimes you'll have to make a judgment call between different safety factors. Are you going to arrive at a big airport with long runway and professional fire engines, but without enough fuel for a diversion? Or are you going to go to a GA airfield with a Land Rover manned by maintenance staff, a 700 meter runway, but with enough fuel to go somewhere else? That is the judgment call in the decision. The A stands for act. In the airline world, they also refer to a sign, but in our aircraft, I'm assuming single crew and that we're going to enact our own decisions. This is the point at which we put our plan into action. Depending on the T for time at the beginning, it could be many minutes from when the occurrence started to when we act. 
If that period of time could potentially take us in the wrong direction, we might choose to enter a hold or orbit while we go through the thinking. So, so far, we've recognized we have an issue. We've determined how much time is at our disposal. We have diagnosed, thought through the options and decided on one option and enacted it. Is that it? Is the die cast? Do we just wait to see how it all works out? Well, of course we don't. We now get to the R of T Dodar, review. We want to know whether our action has either resolved the situation completely or continues to be the best thing to be doing. So we review the situation by starting the whole process again. There are two schools of thought about whether we loop back to diagnose or all the way back to time. I used to think we should just go to diagnose, but I'm now more inclined to think that we should reassess the time element. It may be, for example, that we're encountering unexpected headwinds or the rate of fuel leak has increased and time may be more of a factor than we first thought. Conversely, the fire may have gone out and we can now try to get to an airport rather than land in the field, so we have more time. Why leave time out? It only adds a moment to the process. So we now go through the whole process again and again. Is our diagnosis still correct? Have any more options come available or been lost? Are we happy that we made the right decision? So you keep that process going while at the same time ensuring that your situational awareness will remains broad and that you're not too focused on the presenting problem. Let's now talk about how checklists fit into the T-Dodar and when in the sequence you're going to go through the abnormal or emergency checklist. This is going to depend on when the nature of the unplanned situation becomes clear. Some emergency checklists, such as engine failure after takeoff, start with memory items and are brief before departure. As part of the before takeoff actions, you'll brief yourself, and you might do it out loud to your passenger or instructor, on the immediate actions in the event of power loss or fire at different points. For example, the takeoff brief for a twin will include power loss and fire on the runway below blue line before the gear is raised and after. But once the memory items are completed and the aircraft is stable, you then go through the checklist which will cover the memory items and other less critical items, maybe such as alternator and cow flap. If we move on from briefed memory action checklists, there will be some which are obviously required. For example, if the gear doesn't come down, it's obvious that the landing gear emergency lowering checklist is required, and that is enacted before T-Dodar because the outcome of the checklist, whether the gear comes down or not, is going to make a substantial difference to the management of the rest of the flight. The requirement for other abnormal checklists might only become clear after diagnosis. An example might be regulator failure. And finally, some checklists will only be required once the decision is taken. An example of that would be crossfeed, which is only needed if the flight is going to continue. That's why checklist action doesn't appear in any particular point in T-Dodar, but it must be used whenever the need arises. I hope that run through T-Dodar process is helpful and one day, maybe one day, it might save your skin. But you've got to have the discipline to do it. See you in the next video.